Are there any bill introductions? I do have two bills to introduce. I'm pulling up the RS numbers. Apologize for the delay. Committee, we're going to circle back to bill introductions while we pull up those RS numbers. And we had a little bit of a technology problem, a printer jam in getting the paper testimony into our committee member folder. So apologize for that as well. And with that committee then, we will open the hearing on House Bill 2231, which amends the definition of the crime of conducting a pyramid promotional scheme, providing for an exemption and defining key terms. Asking for a bill brief then from our revisor, Mr. Thompson. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, committee. So we'll begin with House Bill 2231. Hopefully you'll have the bill brief for that. Uh, this is the bill that amends the definition of the crime of conducting a pyramid promotional scheme. Uh, that's current law, KSA 21-5328, that you see there in the bill. Uh, and that makes it a severity level nine non-person felony to knowingly establish, operate, advertise, or promote any pyramid promotional scheme. Um, that's a defined term in, in the current law, and the main purpose of this bill is to amend that definition and then add some other definitions. So the bill first adds a new subsection E. You'll see that in italics there in line 19 of the first page uh, to provide that this section of uh, the criminal code shall not be construed to prohibit a plan or operation or to define a plan or operation as a pyramid promotional scheme if the participants in the plan or operation give consideration in return for the right to receive compensation based upon purchases of goods, services, or intangible property for personal use, consumption, or resale. And then the last clause, if the plan or operation does not cause inventory loading. So there's a long exception there, um, and there's a number of key definitions in there, including compensation, consideration, and then finally inventory loading, all of which are provided in that subsection G, where we have the definition of pyramid promotional scheme. Um, and so I'll just highlight the inventory loading aspect of it. So that is uh, a requirement or encouragement by a plan or operation to have the independent salesperson of the plan or operation purchase inventory in an amount that exceeds the amount that the sale person can expect to resell for ultimate consumption or to use or consume in a reasonable time period or both. So that's the prohibited practice. If that occurs, your plan or operation can be deemed a pyramid scheme, a pyramid promotional scheme. And if that does not occur, you're given an exception from the crime. That's really, I think, the peanut of the bill. Um, and I'll, I'll hopefully uh, see if you have any questions and then stand aside for the proponents to explain to you why they think this change is a, a good policy for you to consider. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Reviser. This is a carryover bill from the last session, and it, it did clearly pass out of the House. Do we have any questions for the Reviser? 
Yes, Senator Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick one. Um, it, with regard to the inventory loading, is there any specific definition about how much money that involves, or is it just a general inventory loading? You got to buy this amount to participate. Mr. Thompson. Madam Chair and Senator, the, the definition in the criminal code that's provided here is just that, that it's an amount that exceeds the amount that the salesperson can expect to resell or to use or consume in a reasonable time period. So there's a little bit of flexibility provided there uh, as to what is reasonable based on, you know, presumably who the, who the person is that's selling, what the product is, what the, you know, what the inventory is. Um, so I think it's, it's got to be a little bit general to provide for all the different options, but um, there would be kind of a fact question there. What, what was reasonable or not? And remember, because this is a crime, what we're looking at is um, uh, presumably a victim of some kind claiming that this company is conducting a pyramid promotional scheme and the company potentially claiming the exception. So then you've got a fact dispute over whether they were inventory loading or not. And that ultimately could be a question for a jury. But, but there is at least some parameter here about what is reasonable um, under the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions for the reviser? Seeing none, then we will invite our first proponent conferee to the podium, Mr. Brian Harrison with Amway Government Affairs. Amway, please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll speak briefly to the bill. We do have our uh, expert from the Direct Selling Association also willing to speak to the bill. I am Brian Harrison from Amway out of Ada, Michigan. We have approximately 4,400 direct sellers here in the state of Kansas who uh, supplement their family's income through the sale of uh, personal goods, nutritional products, cosmetics, and other quality uh, products that they enjoy. And then they uh, try to uh, interest others in using those product uh, products and uh, perhaps selling them as well. Uh, Again, uh, the primary uh, distinction uh, of importance is that you only make money if you buy or sell products uh, in the Amway business. So we do not pay recruiting fees. That is indicative of a pyramid scheme. And so we want to make sure that is firm and clear, not only in those who are interested in our business, but also in law. We think that is where uh, people are taken advantage of. Uh, as far as the inventory loading provision, we also believe that's important. We've seen legitimate businesses come into what we think are unfair trade practices where they say, just buy $5,000 of our product up front and then you can open up a little shop for yourself. We think that's uh, more money than uh, is reasonable. Uh, it's not so much on the money, uh, Senator, you raised a, a good point, uh, in the sense you could buy three water cleaner treatment systems at $1,000, uh, which is highly different than buying 3,000 tubes of toothpaste. Uh, you know, it's much, it might be easier to sell three water treatment systems in a reasonable amount of time, but it's not reasonable to ask someone to buy that much of a consumer good. So I would draw that distinction. Again, we're supportive. We've uh, been involved in this effort to strengthen state laws and states uh, since the Council of State Government uh, adopted this after passage of a very similar law in South Dakota. Uh, and we've been on the road just trying to uh, update, strengthen, and give prosecutors the tools they need uh, to stop these uh, when they come to different states. So I would take any questions. Thank you, and committee will take questions after we hear all the conferees today. Oh, thank, thank you, sorry. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Next, we will hear from Mr. John Webb, Senior Legal Counsel with Direct Selling Association. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. First, thanks for this opportunity to uh, speak with you real quick. Um, there are over 180,000 people in the state of Kansas that are involved in direct selling. Many of them sell for our companies. We're the National Trade Association, which represents companies like Avon and Mary Kay, the Pampered Shelf, folks like that. And one of the things that we've been working on really for over 30 years is making sure that there's clear laws on the books to distinguish between illegal pyramid schemes and legitimate companies that are selling real products to real people. And the key definition there, the key, or the key distinction there, I should say, is that in a pyramid scheme, you're basically recruitment fees. You recruit somebody who pays in a fee, then they recruit somebody, and all the money is being uh, primarily generated by recruitment fees as opposed to direct selling companies, whether they sell cosmetics or they sell nutritional products. They're selling real products to real people. 
And we like to say that, you know, we're retailers. We just retail in a little bit of different way. We don't have a bricks and mortar like a Target or a Walmart. We simply, and we pro the other thing we do, which is great, is we provide an opportunity for people to make a little bit of money on those sales. I will tell you that the vast majority of people involved in direct selling, many of them get involved because they want to make, they, because they love the product and they want to buy them for themselves and their family. And for those that want to sell a little bit on the side, they make modest amounts of money. Uh, but for the stay-at-home mom who makes, you know, $500 for Christmas presents in the fall, that's a big deal. So we want to preserve that opportunity. And one of the ways we do that, and like I said, we've been working on this for over 30 years, is going around the states and making sure there's a clear line of delineation between what is legitimate and what is uh, problematic and should be called illegal. And going back a little bit to the history, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, uh, in 2000, uh, before this 2003 uh, bill in South Dakota, there were about 10 other states that have a previous iteration of this model, including uh, uh, Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana. But in 2003, we worked with the Attorney General in uh, South Dakota and the legislature there uh, on a bill which we think is a good definition and has some good and some good delineations between the good actors and the bad actors. Subsequent to that, in 2004. As Brian suggested, uh, this uh, Council of State Governments, which is a bipartisan, good government uh, organization, adopted as a model, and, and subsequent to that, 16 other states uh, have adopted that. And most recently, Alabama in 2021, Pennsylvania in 2020, and, and Arkansas in 20, 2019. And one of the things that we're very pleased with is that once these laws are on the books, they have been used as serious prosecutions in many cases, so it is something you can prosecute under, which is what we want. We want to put the bad actors uh, out, of the, out of the arena because that actually makes it bad for everybody because you do have people out there saying, you know, we're just like Avon, we're just like Mary Kay, we're just like Pamper Chip, but the reality of it is they are a pyramid scheme. Most recently in Washington State, um, a company, Lulu Row, was prosecuted uh, under this statute and the big problem, at least the way I looked at it, was they had a $5,000 buy-in to the point of reasonableness. I think that was clearly an unreasonable amount of inventory to require someone uh, to take on. And I can tell you right now, for most of our companies now, there is no inventory. Uh, most companies do direct ship now, but for those companies that do, we want to make sure that they're not foisting upon their distributors an unreasonable amount of inventory that they can't sell or use. And that's what this really encourages. So we think it's a good law. We think it's been... Uh, been uh, proven the test of time in many other jurisdictions where it's been used. One of the first things that we did, and we always do when we come into any state and talking to folks, is we talked to Attorney General Derek Smith and said, why don't you look at this and see if you had any issues with the changes. They indicated they didn't have any problems with it. And I can tell you this has always been bipartisan. We've had bipartisan support. We've worked with Democratic AGs, Republican AGs, Democratic legislatures, Republican legislatures, and typically there's typically no opposition to it because the only people presumably that would be opposed to it are people that are bad actors. So with that, I'll just see if there's any questions. I can certainly go into more detail if you like. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, before we start questions, I will ask, are there any other proponent conferees in the committee meeting room or on WebEx? Seeing none then, committee, any questions for either of our proponents today? Yes, Senator Gossage. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here. <clears throat> As I'm rereading the bill, I don't see where there is a change, unless I'm missing it, in the way that this person would be prosecuted or this company yeah, would we, be prosecuted. We typically don't come into the state and say you should change the level. Could you go ahead and introduce yourself um, so those following along online sure. can no know who's talking? No problem. My name is John Webb. I'm with Thank the Direct you. Selling Association. And uh, we typically don't go into a state and say, oh, we think you should change the level of penalty crime. Some states take this opportunity to do it. I know one of the funny things that happens, though, is in a lot of jurisdictions, if you for instance, if it's a high-level misdemeanor and you change it to a felony, it gets a fiscal note. So we didn't change anything on that. My understanding of the bill is there's no change to the level of penalty at all. That was my question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, committee, other questions for the conferees? Seeing none, then, thank you for um, traveling to the state of Kansas for the hearing today and for your testimony committee. Their written testimony is in your... Um, at your seat there and didn't quite make it into committee folders, but it's been a busy morning. So um, thank, thank you, you very much, pleasure. gentlemen, for your uh, testimony and hope you enjoyed uh, Kansas while you've been here. Uh, 
committee then, we will hear from any neutral conferees in the committee meeting room or online. I don't see any or hear that there are any and any opponent conferees in the committee meeting room or online. Seeing or hearing none, then we will close the hearing on House Bill 2231. We will now turn to and open the hearing on Senate Bill 395, which protects private property from unauthorized access by certain government officials and unauthorized surveillance. We will ask for the bill brief from our revisor, Mr. Thompson. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Senate Bill 395, uh, as you mentioned, imposes some restrictions on access to private property and surveillance by employees of the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. Uh, the current law that's not in this bill, but I wanted you to, to get the, the picture of wh where this goes. The current law in KSA 32-808 requires the Secretary of Wildlife and Parks to employ conservation officers and other employees to exercise law enforcement authority. So those are the officers we're talking about. Uh, when we're talking about the officers that enforce the laws under 32808 and the bill. Um, the bill enacts this new section that prohibits those employees from conducting surveillance on private property unless authorized pursuant to a warrant under KSA 22-2502, that of course is the search warrant statute that's in our, our Code of Criminal Procedure, uh, or authorized under the Constitution of the United States, or authorized under one of the following exceptions to the search warrant requirement. Uh, first, exigent circumstances, second, consent searches, or third, the plain view doctrine. And as some of you in the room know from being here over the years or from your legal experience, there are many more than those three exceptions. Um, so naming those three uh, is an attempt to say not the others. Um, so uh, you're only going to be allowed in as a wildlife and parks officer if you can meet one of those three exceptions or another constitutional uh, grounds or you have a warrant under 22-2502. Uh, the definitions there uh, in subsection B1 and 2 of surveillance, uh, that's either physical or electronic presence on private property, and that includes the use of a tracking device, as that would be defined in our search warrant statute, uh, to monitor activity or collect information related to the enforcement of the laws of the state. So that is what this bill attempts to do, and hopefully I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Committee, any questions for the reviser? Senator Haley. Madam Chair, Mr. Thompson, how does this, why is this a distinction for surveillance and warrants for other property um, that's not already in place for other private property already? Uh, our existing laws for um, the need for a warrant for other property beyond uh, wildlife and parks. Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. I, I see from the testimony that the conferees are going to get into this a little bit more. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the very brief overview and, and let them dig into the details. But uh, my understanding is that they're focused on wildlife and parks law enforcement officials because they're the most likely to use the open fields exception to the search warrant requirement. Um, and uh, Senator Peterson's not here to call me professor, but I'll put on my professor hat here for a second. Um, very, very briefly. So the open fields doctrine is a judicially created exception to the Fourth Amendment search requirement, uh, search warrant requirement. Uh, it was enacted in the 1920s and it's been extended ever since, recognized in Kansas by some Kansas case law as well. And essentially just says the Fourth Amendment does not protect what you would call an open field. And that even includes a fenced field. As long as it's kind of out in the open, um, you don't need a warrant or probable cause to search that field. Um, Obviously, you can see why that would come up more so with these law enforcement officers rather than a typical police officer. Um, and so I think the proponents have chosen to focus on that aspect of this and, and state the policy reasons they think that doctrine needs to be sort of abrogated by legislative action uh, rather than continuing to be used by, by law enforcement. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Thompson, for that illumination. And Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions for the reviser? Seeing none, then, we will invite our first proponent conferee to the podium, Representative Ken Corbett, 54th District, Kansas State Legislature. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee, Representative. Thank you. 
First of all, thank you, cha uh, Chairwoman and the committee. Uh, to, to start out a little bit, remember, Candace is about 97% privately owned. So in this is pretty simple. The Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to secure their persons, houses, papers, effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. There's no comma that says any, anybody else can get, get by on this. And the simple thing is this, if a county sheriff, chief of police, the FBI, all, obs all observe the Fourth Amendment, I urge this committee to extend and pass this bill so that their constituents can enjoy the, um, the safety and the security of this, of this bill. And I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Representative. Committee, because we have Representative Corbett here and he might have other committees to attend to while we are conducting our hearing today, I will ask for any questions of the representative that we go ahead and ask those now. Yes, Senator Gossage. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative, for being here. Um, as was brought up earlier, the open field, I think it's called, does this eliminate that? Does this strike that? Representative? That is um, what this bill kind of inter introduces and tries to, uh, to fix a little bit. There's, you know, um, some people think that um, uh, wildlife and parks only goes into open fields. That is, that is a misnomer. They can, they can um, without a search warrant, go into your house or your barn or anything you have. They can put up a camera and surveil you without your knowledge. And I think that any elected official that votes against this shouldn't really be elected to this state of Kansas. The people of Kansas need this protection, and that's why we're here. And one last question. Um, I guess this whole open fields thing was new to me. I didn't even realize that this was on the books. I live in the country, and I think I have property. It's not all fenced. But, you know, just to think that someone could come on my property without getting my permission or having a warrant or whatever um, is troubling. And I think that since it's, you know, you have these um, three or four, these three reasons here, um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you brought this forward. Thank you very much. Well, we, well thank you. Thank you, Senator Haley. And thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Corbett. Um, this, is, this is a Senate bill. Has any has this issue come up before, like in the House? I, I imagine you're one of the prime uh, proponents or sponsors of the legislation. Has this concept been brought before the House, or has it at any other point in time been considered before now? You Representative mean just here in Kansas. Yes, sir. Yeah, we we, um, we ran this in the House. Um, as a lot of times what happens to a bill, uh, people get up and they, they distract your eyes off of the uh, target and it, it got, after about an hour and a half, got kind of, you kind of forgot what you were there for. So I thought this was important enough to uh, try to give them, one more, give them one more look at it. And, uh, and if you can, if anybody on this committee can tell me what this could possibly hurt a resident of Kansas, I'd like to know what it would be. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Corbett, uh, Madam Chair. Do you happen to know what that bill, when that was considered in the House and what that bill number might have been? Or I guess I can find that from uh, research, but if not, I can find it from research. We I can think it's on. 20, House Bill 2025, for, if my memory. Uh, was that last year? Or? Last year, yeah. Okay. So I, I had a lot of people come up to me and ask me to give it another run, because it's just like this. You would not know if you were being surveillanced upon ever until something might come up and you would have no defense. It, and it's a safety issue. You kind of like to know who is wandering around your property or your yard or your garage or whatever. 
It's a good point. I agree with you in many ways. Thank you, Representative Corbin, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions for Representative Corbett? Yes, Senator Pyle. Can you explain, please, uh, Representative, so, so they would absolutely have to have a, um, a warrant to, to enter the property or would permission, uh, I glanced over the bill before I came to committee, can, can I still give permission to law enforcement to just enter my property at any time? Right now, everybody I mentioned here above here, the sheriff, chief of police, and the FBI must obtain a search warrant. Um, the people who this affects, Candace Wildlife and Parks, it does not. That's what we're trying to fix. So if I've got an intruder um, on the back side of my farm and I call Game Warden and say, I, I, you have permission to go back and find them, do they have permission or do they have to obtain yeah, a warrant? Yeah, it's just like anything. I mean, it should be like any other buddy else. If you see somebody drowning, you can help. If you see somebody doing a crime, you can do your job. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't restrict just doing your normal duties as whatever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, other questions for the representative? Seeing none then. Thank you, representative, for coming to committee. You're welcome to stay for the duration of testimony in case other questions come up for you, but I understand you might have other legislative business to attend to. I need to run to the floor and I'll be back. Yes, thank you, representative. Appreciate that. Yes, the House does uh, go on the floor at 11 o'clock. So thank you, representative, for appearing today. Next, we will hear from our proponent conferee, John Luth, Deputy State Director. Americans for Prosperity, Kansas. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of committee. My name is John Luth. I am the Deputy State Director for Americans for Prosperity, Kansas, and I am here today representing thousands of grassroots activists across our state to speak in support of this bill. This is a relatively simple bill, so as such, I will try to keep it relatively simple. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. What we are talking about in SB 395 is strengthening the property rights of Kansans here in the state. The provisions in this bill will ensure that Kansans know that we take serious their private property rights and will not allow those rights to be suspended or trampled in the name of convenience. I want to be really clear about what this bill will not do. This bill will not prevent wildlife and parks officers from doing their work. It will not prevent an officer from acting in an exigent circumstance. It will not prevent an officer from acting if something is in plain view. It will not even prevent them from searching someone's land, property, or surveilling on there. It will, however, require that in the event that search or surveillance is needed and necessary to conduct their work, that a Kansas citizen's private property rights will not be circumvented in the pursuit of that work. This bill simply brings into alignment the due process which must be performed in order to search or surveil that property regardless of whether it be a barn, a bare field, a garage, or any other number of potential structures that may or may not exist on someone's property away from their home by requiring a search warrant to search those things, just as would be required in order to search that same property owner's actual home. According to the Kansas Department of Agriculture, in 2017, there were nearly 60,000 farms in the state of Kansas. That's 60,000 Kansans who likely own large swaths of property that are not directly next to their homes and are at risk of seeing their rights impended upon if this bill were not passed. This bill ensures that Kansans never face that terrifying reality of being surveilled or having their property investigated without their knowledge or without proper due process. Uh, I apologize, I lost my spot. Um, this bill, uh, SB 395, would end the practice of suspending those rights by no longer asking questions such as, how close is this piece of property to someone's home? Is this piece of property enclosed in an enclosure that also goes around their home? Or arguably, one of the most egregious, in my opinion, asking the question of, what steps did the property owner take to shield from view, plain view by a passerby this piece of property? In the end, 
if we pass this, we are sending a clear message to Kansans that we believe in, we support, and we will uphold their constitutionally protected Fourth Amendment private property rights. As such, for these reasons, uh, I would encourage you to support this bill, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Luth. We will take committee questions after we hear from all the proponent conferees. Absolutely. Thank you for your testimony. Next committee, we will hear from Jackie Newland, Associate Counsel, Kansas Livestock Association. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I really appreciate you giving me the time to speak here today as a proponent for SB 395. Um, as was said, I'm Jackie Newland. I represent the Kansas Livestock Association as their associate counsel um, and a new member of the lobbying team as well. Um, I would like to... Um, to say that we actually previously supported HB 2025, which is alluded to as it passed out of committee. Um, it mirrors the language of this current bill. Um, this bill is really targeted, as has been said, at limiting the open fields doctrine, um, which stems from the Fourth Amendment um, and individuals' um, rights against uh, unlawful search and seizure. Um, but that applies to a person's home and that the area immediately surrounding their home. Um, this would extend that further um, to these other aspects of private property. Um, however, I would say that KLA members consider their private property, their farmland, to be of the same importance as their home. Um, that's why we believe that government should either have permission, a warrant, or, exig or exigent circumstances before entering um, to conduct surveillance, to search the property, um, because it really comes down to an issue of property rights and uh, the owners of those property rights being able to decide what type of, of activities are conducted on their land. Um, I won't take too, up too much of your time. A lot of these issues have already been kind of discussed by some of the previous um, individuals providing testimony. I'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak to all of you, and I'd ask you um, to favorably pass SB 395, um, and I'd be happy to stand for questions um, at a later time. Thank you, Ms. Newland. Are there any other proponent conferees in the committee meeting room or online? I don't see or hear from any. Uh, committee, I will direct you to your committee folder. We do have proponent written testimony from John Donnelly, Kansas Farm Bureau. With that then, committee, any questions for our proponent conferees? Yes, Senator Baumgartner. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, this would be for Jackie Newland. Jackie, you made reference to the open field doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at the bill, it says the plain view doctrine. Are those um, identical or are they separate? Go ahead and introduce yourself and yes. then thank you. Sorry, Jackie Newland with the Kansas Livestock Association. Um, so I believe that the open fields doctrine um, really applies to um, search and seizure within a person's home or what they call the curtilage, which is the immediate proximity of one's home. Um, and then those open fields would then be open for search and surveillance. Uh, plain view means that Basically, when you're walking by, if it's something you can see within your plain view, as you, but you're not trespassing onto the property. So that would be the difference between those two doctrines, if, if that helps. It does. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, other questions? I have a question for the reviser to follow up on Senator Baumgartner's question in distinguishing between the plain view doctrine and the open field doctrine. Plain view could apply anywhere, right? If you're at a traffic stop and something is on your front seat in plain view of the um, officer who is conducting the stop, that is part of the plain view doctrine, but would not be part of the open field doctrine. Am I correct in that? And so there is a distinction, and I think it's the physical location of is it an open field or not? Because I, I think plain view can also apply in open field circumstances, but open field circumstances um, 
wouldn't necessarily apply when the plain view doctrine does. For instance, if it's a traffic stop and you're seeing something on the front seat of the car in plain view. So if you could just illuminate that a little bit for a committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Thompson, Revisor's Office. So yes, gen generally what you said is all correct. The, the plain view doctrine, I think, uh, can apply if the officer is anywhere they have the right to be. So if they're conducting a traffic stop, if they're walking down the street, et cetera, it's something in plain view, that's, that's one kind of exception. The open fields is more of a, 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 an exception for place. Uh, it's gotta be a field, uh, some, something away from the home or the curtilage as the conferees were saying, because those are protected by the Fourth Amendment. But if we're talking about a shed out in the middle of a field, that's not going to be protected under the Fourth Amendment because of the open fields doctrine giving you the authority to, to be there. So they, they are two distinct and separate exceptions. Thank you. Committee, other questions for the conferees? Seeing none then, we will ask, are there any neutral conferees in the committee meeting room or online? I don't see or hear any. We do have opponent conferee testimony from Colonel Greg Kaiser, Director of Law Enforcement, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. Please, in, please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and members of the committee. I'm um, Greg Kaiser. I'm the Colonel for the Law Enforcement Division of Wildlife and Parks. I'm here today to represent the uh, men and women who are sworn officers within not only my division, the law enforcement division, but also public lands and parks, uh, the park rangers. Um, the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks opposes the provisions of Senate Bill 395. Senate Bill 395 unduly restricts the otherwise lawful activity, activities of KDWP law enforcement officers. This bill is the counterpart to House Bill 2025 died on the House floor last year by failing to receive sufficient votes to advance to final action. This is an anti-law enforcement bill, and KDWP once again stands in opposition to this legislation and requests this committee's, committee follow the House's actions and defeat Senate Bill 395. Senate Bill 395 essentially proposes to prohibit KDWP law enforcement officers from surveilling private property. Surveilling is defined as being present on private property, either physically or electronically. Several exceptions to KDWP officers being prohibited from private property are mentioned in subsection A, such as when the law enforcement activity is pursuant to a warrant, the United States Constitution, or one of three delineated exceptions to the warrant requirement. Those exceptions include ex exigent circumstances, consent searches, or the plain view doctrine KDWP opposes this bill for a variety of reasons. First of all, it creates a disadvantage for law enforcement officers to fulfill their duty and creates a safe harbor for criminals. Our counterparts in law enforcement across the state, our county sheriffs, KBI, Highway Patrol, and all other state agencies, state law enforcement agencies, would have jurisdiction to enforce conservation laws, but KDWP officers who specialize in conservation law and KDWP regulations would lack that jurisdiction. This creates a significant disparity between officers with jurisdiction to enforce KDWP regulations and adds confusion when courts try to interpret Senate Bill 395. This in turn greatly complicates the criminal prosecution process. It jeopardizes officer safety from other agencies. Many times in more rural areas, we are the, a lot of times the first people, first law enforcement officers on scene, and many times we're the only backup uh, a county officer has, and uh, would create big problems for us, especially on private property. It impairs search and rescue efforts by game wardens, whether we use our canine units, aircraft, or watercraft. All of our officers would be prohibited from looking for lost or kidnapped individuals or drowning victims on private property, which includes non-navigable waterways, regardless of whether the search and rescue effort was potentially connected to criminal activity. And I have two examples of events where we've been called in the past. In Wabunsee County, we had a canine officer that was called to locate a young boy who ran away from his grandmother. 
at the rest stop on I-70 in Wabunsee County. The boy was suffering from a disorder where he's obsessed with water. It's called Angelman syndrome. The canine officer and his canine tracked the boy across I-70 and, and he was located nude in a creek under a log on private property. This was in March and the boy was hypothermic. Again in January of just 2021 in Morris County, a KDWP officer with a drone was called to locate a 74-year-old woman with dementia who had walked away from her rural home. The game warden deployed a drone and searched for the woman who was found before dark, but she had laid down between two rows of big round hay bales to stay warm after she'd grown tired. More than likely, she would not have survived the night. This bill directly conflicts with the thoroughly tested open field doctrine. I believe there's some confusion about the legal theory of the, of the plain view doctrine, which appears in the bill and the open field doctrine. These are two totally different warrant exceptions. Plain view typically allows an officer to use evidence they observe within a home, car, or building when they are at a location they are authorized to be in while investigating criminal activity. The open field doctrine states that a criminal Criminals do not have the legitimate privacy interest in an open field, empty lot, or other open areas except next to a home against law enforcement surveilling or being present in such areas. I will address uh, previous testimony by uh, Representative Corbin. The game wardens attend KLATC, the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center in Hutchison. Um, and we are trained exactly the same as sheriff's deputies, police officers, everybody else that attends the academy. Um, we do not have the right to go on a, in a residence without a warrant. We are just like the regular police. There's no exceptions. Um, there's a lot of wives' tales out there. I spent 30 years with Highway Patrol here in Kansas, and I found it shocking that I had people come up to me and say, well, you have more authority now than you had as a state trooper. And it's like, how, how's that? Well, you can just go in anybody's home whenever you want. No, I can't. That's all false. We have to have a warrant just like anybody else. Surveilling suspicious activities on public property where the officer is physically located or on adjacent property would be prohibited. This could impair investigations into possible marijuana grows, meth labs, unlawful timber harvesting, etc. We'd no longer be able to conduct night surveillance flights or surveillance for spotlighting individuals, potentially shooting at big game on private property. I spent many years with KHB aircraft uh, on, on uh, um, those type of flights, and those, those would be off the boards if we enacted this bill. It impairs KDWP officers' ability to protect private property from trespass or criminal activity. It prohibits the entering onto private property to check for proper licensing and to verify hunters and anglers that have landowner permission. Many landowners are absentee or live many miles away. In closing, as outlined above, the bill would create a significant impact to the operations of KDWP law enforcement, as well as jeopardize officer safety and public safety by creating a significant disparity between our officers and other law enforcement agencies. This would have unknown consequ consequences that impact both our courts and the individuals out in the field working to enforce the laws. I would say one more thing. If there's any individuals out there that have concerns about cameras or, or, or operations, we've not had any complaints in the time that I've been here. And even going back, we've researched, cannot find any complaints. So in our opinion, it's it's not happening. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. We will go ahead and ask for any opponent testimony in person in the committee meeting room or online. Don't see or hear any uh, committee. There is opponent written only testimony in your folder from Casey Slaughter, President, Kansas State Lodge, Fraternal Order of Police. And with that, then, we will ask uh, for any committee questions for our conferee, uh, Colonel Kaiser. Any committee questions for um, our opponent conferee? I do have a couple, just to make sure that I clearly understand what the bill does and what it doesn't do. 
um, you described some circumstances where there's, you know, someone in physical danger. You described a child and, a, and an el elderly person as well. And maybe this is a question for the advisor. Would that fall within the exigent circumstances exception where um, wildlife and parks would not need a warrant to enter the property to do the search and rescue um, operation? Well, we believe it would impact us and where we would be unable to go onto those properties. Okay. Mr. Reviser, um, if you could explain for the committee exigent circumstances and the exception when law enforcement and uh, wildlife and parks would not need a warrant under exigent circumstances to enter the private property? If, if you can, <laughs> kind of the exigent circumstances doctrine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jason Thompson, Revisor's Office. I'm not as familiar with that one as I should be right now. It's been a little while since law school. Um, but generally speaking, uh, the, the key thing that I can't speak to right now is, is, for example, with plain view, you have to have a right to be there, right? You, you can't just be, you can't go into a home without probable cause or without um, authority to be there and see something in plain view and then validly seize that, right? You have to have the right to be there first for the doctrine to kick in. And with exigent circumstances, I believe there's a similar probable cause or um, a, a right to be there or, or something to that effect, right? You're, you're searching for criminal activity. You're, you've got probable cause to believe that something is happening that requires you to go there in an emergency situation. Um, and, and I don't want to uh, go too far into what the, you know, the, the conferee's experience, right? Because um, whether that's criminal conduct is not clear, right? If you're searching for a, a victim or a lost person, I don't know how exigent circumstances would apply or not specifically. Um, and, and, and maybe, I mean, not to be too academic about it, but, but the practical application of it is maybe more important. Um, what, what the conferee says their officers would do under those circumstances and whether they feel like they have a valid reason to go there or not, I, I, I would hope they could articulate some basis for doing that um, without a warrant. I, I think there might be some provided here in the bill, but, but I don't want to go out and say that you know, they're wrong or that I have the answer that they don't have. I hope that makes sense. I'm trying to not be an advocate one way or another here. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Appreciate that. Committee, I want to direct the committee's attention to a U.S. Supreme Court case that might um, help provide some further clarification of exigent circumstances where the wildlife and parks officer would not need a warrant to go ahead and enter the private property. It's Missouri versus McNeely. It's a 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court clarified a variety of circumstances may give rise to an exigency sufficient to justify a warrantless search, including law enforcement's need to provide emergency assistance to an occupant of a home, and then there's an ellipsis, so there's some deleted from this quote, engage in hot pursuit of a fleeing suspect, or to enter a burning building to put out a fire and investigate its cause. So in the kind of search and rescue situation, if we're looking at Missouri versus McNeely, that could possibly be the kind of exigent circumstances that give rise to an exigency that would sufficiently justify a warrantless search. So my understanding of the doctrine is in those kind of search and rescue instances, a warrant would not be required for Department of Wildlife and Parks to enter the property to conduct the, the rescue operation. Um, I had a couple of other questions. Um, you made a statement, sir, that um, the bill would uh, prohibit wildlife and parks from enforcing conservation laws. And I, I don't understand why that would be, because the conservation laws could still be enforced. It would just require a warrant in these, um, if the bill were to be enacted. Well, if. Madam Chair, uh, Colonel Kaiser with Wildlife Parks, if we were to be on patrol and see someone out in the field killing a deer or anything like that, hunting, 
Um, you know, we don't know who the on owner is. A lot of times they're absentee owners. Uh, the question is, would we be allowed to go on that property to, to do license checks? Uh, even if we just seen them out there hunting, um, we have a law in place for the purple paint. And that allows us to go on property by landowner's permission. But many of those landowners, um, if they give permission to somebody we don't know, I mean, can we really go on their property and, ch and check them anymore on that op on the open fields? So it really comes into question what are we're going to be able to allow to do on on going on the private property and check people and their licenses. Thank you. I've seen the purple paint on um, property that's used to hunt, and that's indicating permission for. Um, wildlife and parks to enter to search licenses, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. And so that would still exist if this bill were to be enacted because one of the exceptions to having to have a warrant is consent searches. And with the purple paint, the private property owner has indicated consent for those types of searches, if I'm understanding the purple paint demarcation correctly. I believe at this point, we just need a reasonable suspicion to go on, on the property. You gotta, have, you gotta have probable cause to get a warrant. Right. That's more than reasonable suspicion. Correct. Thank you. Committee, other questions? Yes, Senator Gossage and then Senator Wilborn. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the way the statement in the bill says the plain view doctrine, you would not need to have a warrant. So if you saw someone uh, killing a deer or whatever, wouldn't that be plain view doctrine and you could still go on the property without a warrant? Go ahead, Colonel. In theory, yes. However, we just have a lot of issues with this bill and what we're going to be allowed to do at the, at the end of the day. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Wilborn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Colonel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your past service and what the Wildlife and Parks does. I appreciate that as an avid hunter and outdoorsman. My question is very simple. How can we square the rights of the Fourth Amendment balanced against some inconveniences that I see that we could probably overcome. Can, can you clarify that, sir, your question? Uh, well, how do you square the fact that there are rights under the Fourth Amendment with what you propose would be some inconveniences to conduct your searches? Right now, we're no different than any other agency. And the Sheriff's Departments, Police Departments, and I guess the question is, why is wildlife and works officers being singled out? And as a sheriff's deputy or as a state trooper, I can enforce any fish and game law and go on those properties, but we're being limited under this bill what our officers can or cannot do. Apparently, I, excuse me, Madam Chairman, apparently I wasn't clear. Okay. It appears to me that the Fourth Amendment is pretty solid and the foundation is there and is established. There are some differences between the different law enforcement agencies right. in their right, the way they pursue and prevail over uh, proposed wrongdoers. I guess my concern is that we're not abiding by the Fourth Amendment rights if, unless this bill is passed for property owners. I do believe we are in compliance. And, uh, you know, currently we do have policy in place that uh, our officers, to, to place cameras on a property, we, we have to um, get a court order or consent of the landowner or tenant or with prior approval from the county attorney or district attorney in investigating a case. So, like, for instance, like cameras, pole cameras up on property. We don't do that. If, we, if, we, if we're going to do that, we're going to get a, a court order, go through the county attorney, and be above board. Um, this legislation came out of a case in Mississippi, or Tennessee, I believe it was. And uh, like I said before, we have not had any complaints from the public of our officers violating anybody's rights, property rights. I, I welcome those calls and we'll investigate them. But to, the, to date, we haven't had any. So to my knowledge, we don't have a problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
or excuse me, I'm sorry, Senator Pyle. Boy, I don't know anybody that's confused me with Senator Thompson, but that's okay. <laughs> I can be a weatherman for a day. Anyway, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you explain the difference? We brought up purple paint. Can you explain the difference between purple paint and no trespassing signs? Go ahead, Colonel. The purple paint, uh, the officers, I don't have to have your, um, the landowner, they, they basically are saying that the, the officer can, can file the complaint on their behalf, or the purple paint. The no trespassing, the, the landowner would have to be the complainant in the case. So there is a clear difference and it's distinguishable and law enforcement understands that? Pardon me, sir? Law enforcement understands the distinguishable dis difference, whether it's wildlife and parks or local law enforcement. Do they, are they educated at the training center the difference between a no trespassing sign and purple paint? For other law enforcement agencies, I don't know as far as a training center if they go into that or not. I do not know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions? I have one other question. Um, you had talked about um, surveillance with a camera that might be um, impacted if the bill were to be enacted. Couldn't the surveillance with a camera still be conducted, but it would require a search warrant if Senate Bill 395 were enacted? You could still do the surveillance with the camera. It would just require a search warrant unless we have exigent circumstances, consent, or plain view doctrine. You're, you're correct there. The question is even, can we sit on a private road and surveil property? You know, under this, that's even in question, in our opinion. So we, we believe it greatly impacts what our officers are gonna be able to do as far as just on a regular patrol. If you look at your window and see something, are we violating this bill? Thank you, and I, I appreciate the, you know, desire for clarity, and that's what we need to do in our laws, of course, and not write uh, them vaguely. I do see in the bill at line 16 that surveillance means either physical or electronic presence on private property. So in the circumstance of wildlife and parks officers driving by, that would not be impacted by Senate Bill 395, the officers, as I look at Senate Bill 395, could still drive by as long as they are not physically or electronically present on the private property. Um, any other questions for uh, the Colonel here today? I don't, oh, yes, Senator Gossage. Thank you, Madam Chair, more of just a comment. It seems that this bill would do more to clarify what they may do as opposed to restrict what they may do. And I'm not sure if I phrase that in the form of a question. But uh, by clarifying, you need a search warrant for this, but in these circumstances, you would not need a search warrant. You could still do all of the things that you're talking about. And I agree with um, a Senator, uh, Vice Chair, who said, you know, we appreciate everything you do. I appreciate it. Um, but does, could this not clarify we when you would, would need it? Um, Madam Senator, um, Colonel Kaiser, Wildlife Parks, we believe it would not clarify things. It would, it would muddy up the water even more and make it more difficult for us to do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. And thank you, Colonel, for appearing today in committee. And thank you for the work that the Wildlife and Parks Department does and uh, enforcing the laws. Um, across the state. So thank you very much. And committee then, with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 395. We have on the agenda one other bill. Um, we have, I, I would like to conclude by 1150 today, so that gives us about 13 minutes. I think we should go ahead and open the hearing.
on HB 2277, clarifying the definition of possession in the Kansas Criminal Code. Because all of our proponent conferees, and in fact, all of our conferees have signed up via WebEx, we are not um, impacting anyone um, who spent time to travel to the Capitol today as everyone is virtually uh, appearing via WebEx. So with that, I will ask, and we will get as far as we can, committee, and uh, see where we are then at 11.50. Thank you, and ask for the bill brief from the revisor, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, committee, House Bill 2277 uh, deals with the definition of possession in the criminal code. Uh, I forgot to note on the last House bill that this is a carryover bill, and so I'll do that here. Um, it passed out of the House Committee on Corrections and Juvenile Justice last session. Uh, on the committee, in the Committee of the Whole, it was, a do, uh, an, it was amended. Uh, on motion of Representative Probst, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then ultimately the bill passed out as amended uh, 116 yes to eight no. So there's your, um, your background on the bill and how it came to you. Um, I will note there would be some technical amendments to the dates and such if you do choose to move this forward. So that, that's out there as well. Um, I'll try to keep this very short. The current law there in KSA 21-5111, that's the definition section for our entire criminal code. Uh, Possession is defined as having joint or exclusive control over an item with knowledge of or intent to have such control. And I underlined that language. That's the language that's stricken uh, in the bill. You'll see that it provides two culpability terms, knowledge or intent. And as the prosecutors will explain to you in their testimony, uh, that creates a difficult burden. Uh, you usually have to prove the higher of the two, right? Um, uh, so this would clarify that or change that to, to be clear that this uh, possession is knowingly having joint or exclusive control over an item. So uh, you have one culpability term that is knowingly, and that would be the definition used throughout the code. Uh, the House Committee on Judiciary, uh, we realized that uh, there was also a definition of possession in KSA 21-5701, which is part of the criminal code relating to controlled substances. Uh, we're not sure why there were two definitions. They were identical. They should be identical. They're both part of the criminal code. So we were recommending they remove that. Uh, and that's what the House Committee did. Uh, once that section was in the bill, on the floor, uh, again, Representative Probst made an amendment to change the definition of drug paraphernalia that appears in that statute. And that's the change you find in uh, subsection F4 of that statute. Uh, it's a very small change. You almost miss it if you're reading through because of the font. Uh, it's on page six in line 25 through 27. That's the definition piece that is amended. Uh, paraphernalia means all sorts of things, and then there's a list of examples. Uh, F4, the example is testing equipment used or intended to for use in identifying or in analyzing the strength, effectiveness, or purity of controlled substances. And then the amendment, excluding fentanyl testing strips. So there's the small amendment that is added there, uh, which I think you've got some testimony on about whether um, those are included as paraphernalia now, whether they should be considered paraphernalia and the policy choice that's being made there. So I'll just point it out to you and then uh, let the conferees explain to you why that's a, a good idea or not a good idea. Um, so those are the two main changes, the definition of possession and then the floor amendment that changed the definition of drug paraphernalia related to uh, fentanyl testing strips. Committee questions for the reviser. So the knowing standard is higher than the, um, th that's the higher standard of the two, correct? Uh, Madam Chair, um, so th there are three standards of, or three. Uh, uh, Mens rea for yes. culpability in, in the criminal. Culpability, thank code. you. Yep. That is the word I was trying to think of. It was <laughs> on the tip of my tongue. There are three culpability terms in the criminal code, recklessly, knowingly, intentionally, right? So. Um, and, and it's in that order. So knowingly is the middle one, right? Recklessly is the lowest, knowingly is the middle, uh, intent or specific intent is the highest. And you'll see the current definition has a mix of that knowledge or that intent. And I think that's what the prosecutors are going to say is causing the issue of, of having to prove that higher burden um, rather than just having knowingly there, which is what knowledge would imply should have been the standard um, is, is what they're asking you to do, to just get that intent part out of there, make it clear that it's knowingly, we've got one standard well-defined, and that's what they want to prove going forward. So that's the policy choice you're being asked to make. Thank you. And one other question, this might be for research. Do we have any legislative intent that tells us on page six 
at lines 25 through 27, that's subsection F4, testing equipment used or intended for use in identifying or in analyzing the strength, effectiveness, or purity of controlled substances. Was the testing equipment meant to be used by law enforcement, or was the testing equipment intended to be possessed or used by the consumer of the drugs? Or, I'm sorry, of the controlled substances? Do we have any legislative intent on that? I'll chime in if you want to go ahead, Natalie. I'll, I'll, I've got something after that. <laughs> Um, this is Natalie Nelson, Legislative Research. I'm um, looking at the SUP note from last year. Um, and I don't see it that it was um, brought up in the background in the testimony, but um, Jason might rem recall. I think if I'm looking, I mean, it's talking about further down in subsection F, scales, uh, dilutants. Um, other things like that, that these are drug paraphernalia possessed by the consumers of the controlled substance and not law enforcement. Is that kind of what subsection F on page 6 um, looks at? Yes. Th thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll give you the two-part answer. The first is that drug paraphernalia defined there in, at the beginning of F is all the equipment and materials, et cetera, that is used for the purposes of doing all of these things in violation of the drug code, right? That's the last piece of uh, there, that, uh, line 14 and 15, in violation of this act, right? So you're doing something that is a violation of the drug laws, and law enforcement doing something with these materials is not a violation of the drug law. So that's, that's the main thing. And then the secondary part is even uh, this, this is not an exclusive list, right? Drug paraphernalia shall include, but is not limited to that whole list. Um, and then there's a separate statute, 2157, I forget the number, maybe one of the prosecutors would have it for you, um, maybe 5713 or so, so somewhere in, the, in that range, um, that defines uh, uh, tests that you can do for whether something is paraphernalia. It looks at the facts and circumstances surrounding the object and helps the judge or the trier of fact, the jury, determine whether something is or is not paraphernalia under the specific circumstances. So it's kind of a a multi-part aspect of whether something is or is not paraphernalia, because something may be sold as an innocuous item, but it is paraphernalia in a specific case, or something could be directly marketed as paraphernalia, and it's obviously paraphernalia, and you've got to kind of, you've got to kind of cover both under the criminal code. Thank you. Committee, other questions for the reviser? Seeing none, then. We do have... Um, six proponent conferees uh, via WebEx, um, we can go ahead and get started with the first, if uh, we can have an agreement um, with the conferee that uh, in any continuation of the hearing to a separate day that he would um, appear again for any questions that we'll take at the end of um, the proponent conferee. So with that, we will um, invite and ask uh, Aaron Breitenbach, Deputy District Attorney, 18th Judicial District, Kansas County and District Attorneys Association, to identify himself, and I want to welcome you back to committee. And if we are not able to conclude our hearing today, which we won't, we will need to continue it to a later date, would you appear again um, at that later date for questions? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Aaron Breitenbach, the District Attorney's Office in Wichita. Yes, I'd be glad to come back to answer future questions. And I appreciate you trying to at least start us today to uh, to start this conversation. Uh, thankfully, this is a relatively straightforward bill. Um, uh, Mr. Thompson explained it pretty well there. Uh, to be clear, the KCDAA is really just here to speak on behalf of the original proposal, which is to uh, clarify the definition of possession. We have no opinion about the, the House Amendment and candidly would rather make sure that any concern about that not derail this bill. You know, step one is to get this definition changed because possession is one of the most uh, kind of fundamental uh, charges that we prosecute. Uh, and so to have a clear definition of, of what that means is, is really kind of a building block to a lot of our cases. 
what's interesting, I think, is just to keep in mind that this definition of possession predates the recodification that happened in 2011, where great effort was made to distinguish between the meaning of the words knowing and intentional. Historically, that wasn't the case. And so when that, when those revisions were made, this, this language just didn't get tidied up. And of course, it was a Herculean effort to do what they did. So it's not surprising that a few one-offs like this might be missed. But to, to tell a jury that there are two different mens rea for the same crime, you know, getting 12 people to agree to anything these days is difficult. But when we can't even give them a clear meaning of what we're trying to prove, it's just very difficult and causes a lot of confusion for jurors, for judges, and obviously for the litigants. Uh, what we are doing by asking to clarify to just use the word knowing, we are bringing, we are bringing us back to what we've always had in, in these type of cases, which is a general intent. You know, do I know it's a phone and do I know I'm possessing it? You know, as opposed to exactly what I, you know, there are some crimes that talk about what I intend to do with the substance. That's a whole other crime. But just the simple understanding of it's a phone um, or in this case that it's a controlled substance because when we bring in the word intentional it starts to create some confusion about you know some of these drugs are, are mixtures of many drugs and the defendant will say well i you know i thought it was this you know i thought it was methamphetamine turns out it was fentanyl uh i didn't know it was fentanyl so therefore I didn't intend to do it. No, that, that can't be the purpose of this of this law, right? It's, it's to prohibit knowing possession of a controlled substance. And, and that's what we are attempting to do by clarifying this language. With that, I'm gonna, for time, I'm gonna stop. And I just appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Breitenbach. Um, committee, do we have any quick questions for Mr. Breitenbach? If not, we will invite him back for uh, any continuation of this hearing. And thank you very much for your patience today, Mr. Breitenbach, and uh, for the work that you do and for your testimony today. Uh, with that committee, then, we are going to... With that committee, we are going to suspend and hold open the hearing on House Bill 2277 to be continued at a later date. And before we adjourn, I have two bill introductions to make. One is 22 RS 2882. It concerns elections relating to election audits concerning election procedures and amending KSA 253009 and repealing the existing section. The other, and it is deemed uh, introduced. The other bill is 22 RS 2745. It is an act concerning elections relating to voter registration and requiring a county election officer to send a confirmation notice if there is no election related activity uh, for any four-year calendar period. And that will be deemed introduced as well. Committee, thank you for your attention today and for your work. And for those in the committee meeting room, thank you as well, and those following along online. With that, committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>